imagine beholding the epic curvature of Earth without having to risk your life on a rocket launch. A new company called Space Perspective is on its way to offering another option for high-flying tourists. With luxury balloon flights to the stratosphere, complete with an onboard bar, it may soon be possible to enjoy a cocktail along with views of our planet from 100,000 feet up. I'm so thrilled to welcome Jane Pointer. She is the founder and co-CEO of Space Perspective. Thank you, Jane, so much for joining us. Yeah, totally my pleasure. It's great. Well, Space Perspective is such a new type of flight. Could you just tell me a little bit about the company and what its origins are? So Space Perspective, if we think of ourselves as the very first luxury space flight experience company. And that's because we're able to give flight to people in a way that is incredibly comfortable, extremely accessible because there are no rockets involved. So we use a large space balloon, which goes to space at a roaring 12 miles an hour, which allows us to have this very smooth, gentle and long suborbital flight, a six hour flight. That's so interesting. So how high does it go? Is it to the edge of space? You mentioned it was suborbital. Yeah, so it's a 20 mile high flight. So we go up to above the atmosphere. So you've got 99% of the atmosphere below you. So the view is ostensibly the same as any other uh, uh, suborbital flight that mm -hmm. you might encounter. The others are all are all based on, on rocket flight. So the view is the same. Uh, you get up there, you're above the atmosphere, so the sky is completely black. You get the curvature of the Earth, that you know iconic thin blue line of the atmosphere that astronauts talk about in such such poignant ways. That's so cool, and you know it's so funny too because like as transformative as amazing as going to space is, uh, it is also a very uncomfortable experience most of the time, right? And astronauts tend not to talk so much about that. Um, so this is really, you know, for it seems like for people who might want to have this experience, but don't want to go through, yeah, rocket launches and all the stress of microgravity and all that, kind of a perfect option. So can you tell us a little bit about what the interior of this balloon is like and, uh, you know, sort of just the design and experience of this flight? Yeah, so the capsule itself is a, a pressurized capsule, very comfortable. There's seats, eight people and a pilot. Uh, and it has a bar on board. It has Wi-Fi. It has a loo because it is a self, uh, a six hour flight. You know, and we think that every self-respecting spaceship should have a bar. What? I believe this beverage has produced an emotional response. It's really designed with the human experience at the center of it. And for us, we're, you know, we, I've talked to a lot of astronauts about their experience of going to space. And, you know, they really talk about the quintessential astronaut experience is sitting in the window, relaxed for as long as they can, looking at our incredible planet from that vantage point. And, you know, for most of them, it's incredibly moving. They really connect with our planet and with the singular human family that, that inhabits Spaceship Earth. And so that's the experience that we want to give our explorers, uh, as we give, uh, as we call them. And so the vehicle has, it's basically a huge flying window with mm -hmm. 360 degree panoramic view all around. And having a drink, I mean, that is just like such a new, that, that really does seem like science fiction to be up in the stratosphere, having a nice drink, looking at Earth. <laughs> You know what's really fun? So so we put tickets on sale earlier this year in February. And we've you know, we've just seen huge demand for this. We've already seen we already sold 450 tickets, more than that now. And what's fun is that almost half of those have been sold as complete flights, eight people per flight. And what is happening is people will call up and they'll say, hey, I want two tickets for myself, but could you hold the whole capsule for a few days? I'm just going to go and canvas my friends and collect them together so that we can all go together. And sure enough, a few days later, they 
they come back and they book the entire flight for friends. And we even have some people that have booked a flight for them to go with their friends, a flight for them to go with their family. So this, what's really cool about what we're able to do with Spaceship Neptune, as our vehicle is called, is that we're really able to make this a social event for people, which is, is incredibly important, I think. Yeah, that's totally a new type of space experience, I feel like, yeah. Um, and, you know, mentioning space, uh, Spaceship Neptune, um, you did the first test flight, I believe, this summer, right? So how did that go and, and where did it uh, end up going? We did do the first test flight uh, this year in June, and it was spectacular. We launched from a, the spaceport adjacent to Kennedy Space Center. We had the unpressurized capsule go through the full flight profile up above 100,000 feet, 20 miles as we're going. A couple of hours at the top, a couple of hours back down to splash down in the Gulf. And it was right where we want it to be next door to the ship that is going to, that retrieved it and brought it all ashore. So honestly, it was picture perfect. It was really, really a great flight. So how many of these test flights with the unpressurized or uncrewed um, uh, spaceship Neptune are you planning to do before you do crew flights? Yeah, one of the really, really cool things about this vehicle is that we can fly it autonomously. And what's important for us about that with regards to test flights is that we get to do a lot of flights without ever putting a human on board. And so we can test the vehicle through all kinds of off nominal scenarios and test all the redundant systems to make sure that they take care of all of those off nominal scenarios so that we can really put the vehicle through its paces before we ever put a human on, on board. And so we're gonna have our first uh, human flight, our first piloted flight in 23, and then our first commercial flight in 2024, towards the end of 24. That's so, that's such a quick timeline. I, mean, I know, I it is. It's a, yeah. it's definitely an aggressive uh, time uh, time frame, but it, you know, it's coming soon, but but it's uh, it's really doable and we're really excited to be able to bring this to people that quickly. I have to ask, when do you want to uh, fly first? Will you be on that first crude flight? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm gonna be on one of the very early flights. You gotta believe it, absolutely. You know, the way I'm envisioning these flights going is that imagine getting up very early in the morning and it's dark out. And you get into this very comfortable capsule. You sit down with your closest friends and launch. It'll be very smooth when it launches. And it does take about two hours to get to space. And then you'll be up there without the light pollution of the sun. And if, it's, if there's no moon out, it's going to be just pitch black and you're going to be a above the atmosphere. So it's gonna be a starscape like you've never seen. Then the sun will start coming up over the limb of the earth and you'll see the curved horizon and the sunrise in space is just ridiculous. The way the sun comes through the atmosphere, it creates rainbows and shafts of shadows and you get the, really get the three dimensionality of our world. Mm -hmm. And then once the sun is fully up above the horizon, you'll see the whole soul, our sun, in the blackness of space. And of course, the light up there is very high contrast and, and stark. And you'll see that iconic thin blue line. It's just going to be incredible. And will the spaceship Neptune um, be joined by a fleet or are you focusing mainly on this one balloon uh, as, the, as the passenger vessel? We will have a, a initially uh, our capsule, Spaceship Neptune, will fly from the Kennedy uh, Space Center, and then there are other um, spaceports in the region as well. So we will always have at least one uh, capsule and, a, and a, a second one there on standby. Uh, and then we're going to build a whole fleet of spaceships so that not only we can do a lot of flights from the Florida area, but also then start to fly them from elsewhere around the world. So we really get the opportunity to fly from all places around the world, including Alaska, for example, where you could see the Northern Lights from space. Oh yeah. That's just astonishing. That must be, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the, to the polar region flights. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And I think that that really is part of it. You know, the, the whole idea that you'd be looking down and being like, wait, I'm not looking at a map or a globe. <laughs> this is actually it. So, you know, you mentioned also that um, the, the spaceship can be uh, 
uh, controlled autonomously, but it also has a pilot. What are the why? Why both the manual and the autonomous control there? Well, the autonomous is because uh, you have redundancies, right? We want redundancies in everything. So one of the redundancies is we have a single pilot going up, but we also then have a co-pilot on the ground. And then the extra layer is that the vehicle can fly itself. So let's not tell the pilot that. <laughs> so the pilot, a lot of the time, it, you know, it's not like flying, you know, stick and rudder or something, right? The pilot, a lot of the time, is there really to be the guide for the people who are on Spaceship Neptune and making sure they're really having the most incredible experience possible. So what are the safety measures in case there is some kind of emergency with the balloon, if it springs a leak or something like that? So we have redundancies built into every aspect uh, of Spaceship Neptune. And between the balloon and the capsule is a pre-deployed parachute. Pre-deployed being that it's already strung out. And in fact, the way NASA and other governments around the world tend to bring payloads back from these high altitudes from a balloon is they actually use these kinds of parachutes. So they release the parachute from with the payload from the balloon and bring it back down. And in thousands of flights, it's never failed. So that's what we have as a reserve, what we call the reserve descent system. So it's as a backup all the way through the flight because the flight goes up under the balloon and comes back down under the balloon. So the parachute is always there in reserve to help with a, a safe landing. So people watching this who are interested in being on one of these flights, how much are these tickets costing right now? Yeah, we're thrilled that we're able to offer a ticket price that's below anybody else. We're going to space. So it is $125,000 a ticket. Uh, you know, and our long-term vision is to bring the price down. Uh, but right now it's $125,000 a ticket and you can go to our website at spaceperspective.com and now you can buy a ticket to space online. And right now all that's needed is a refundable deposit. How, how do you see these balloons developing in the future? Are there, are there other ways that they could push the frontiers? Well, we certainly want to go for, first of all, we're going for a six hour flight. But how amazing would it be if you could stay up there overnight or even several days? Eventually you could even go around the world. So think of it almost like a, a, a space hotel using a space balloon would be amazing. I think it is just the idea that you wouldn't have to go on a giant explosion to space. <laughs> like you wouldn't have to ride on a rocket and have that kind of very, uh, yeah, not, not particularly comfortable trip into space. Um, and, and, you know, it, it does seem like that is part of this changing landscape of space tourism, where there's a lot of different options now that are emerging. We just had Inspiration4 come back, of course, the orbital flight, and um, I mentioned, you know, the, the uh, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic one. So the, do you see this space tourism um, kind of evolving in the future as this patchwork of different techniques? And I, I just love to know how you envision it coming together that way. Yeah, so I've, I've been in this industry for over 30 years now in, in commercial space, all the way back from the time when I was in Biosphere 2, which was, you know, the really the very first attempt at making uh, another human-made biosphere that could be one day a, uh, a prototype space base, for example, on, say, Mars or somewhere like that. So, yes, I've watched this industry emerge and become really something that is going to carry us into the future now. So if you think about back in the early 2000s, eight private citizens went to space, but they were taken there all by governments, whether it was the American government or the Russian government at that time. And now, of course, we're seeing private entities taking people to space. And so, you know, us, and other rocket-based uh, suborbital flights will be taking people up on these shorter, maybe a, a short period of time for a few hours to, to a few days. You know, then there, of course, there will be uh, people who will then graduate in a sense. Uh, those people who are, are intrepid, who want to go on a rocket, will then go on a low Earth orbit, as we just saw with Inspiration4, which was really cool to also see, by the way, two men and two women on that because typically only 10% of people that have gone to space are women, just saying. So that's pretty awesome. 
So we're also beginning to see more uh, types of people going to space, which is really cool. Uh, and yeah, that's, we're going to see space hotels emerging in, in, in orbit. And then we are going to see a hotel eventually on the moon and eventually on Mars. So I absolutely see that we're going to be a multi-planetary species and people having access to space in just a whole variety of ways.